I now have the honor of introducing Elizabeth Sears uh, from uh, University of Michigan. Uh, please welcome. Thank you. I think there's, there are quite a number of connections between uh, the last paper and this. In 1980, in his important book, The Critical Historians of Art, Michael Padro sought to define the gap between the methodologies of Erwin Panofsky and A.B. Warburg. While he acknowledged that the interests of the two scholars overlapped, that Panofsky had worked in Warburg's ambience in Hamburg, and that some of Panofsky's early work was published by the Warburg Library, this, Padro said, should not obscure the differences. In no writer was the conception of art as like knowledge so elaborately developed as by Panofsky. In no writer had art been so integrated into the sense of social behavior as by Warburg. In setting up the provocative antithesis, Padro, in a good way, was seeking to unsettle the prevailing narrative according to which Panofsky, disciple-like, logically fulfilled, and seamlessly developed Warburgian potentials. <coughs> Padro, who himself had strong ties with the Warburg Institute, was participating in the wave of disciplinary self-awareness and self-critique that came about as the new art history gathered force. This was the time when Panofsky's colossally influential brand of iconological study was coming under intense critical scrutiny. And concurrently, Warburg's star was rising. In Anglophone circles, Panofsky's later works in English were, of course, best known and most targeted. That is, the works produced after 1933, after Panofsky had been dismissed from the University of Hamburg as a non-Aryan, and after he had landed at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study. Critique, and I'm speaking largely of Anglophone and even of American situation, uh, devolved into topoi. Panofsky and iconology came to be branded as logocentric, that is, assuming a specific text behind every image, Eurocentric, unattuned to social layering and fragmentation, and as practiced by followers, formulaic. Warburg's iconology was, is, seen to offer alternatives. The exercise of setting Warburg against Panofsky, now a familiar one, has obvious heuristic value and I'll today be entering into the fray. Whereas Padro arrived at his antithesis by analyzing text alone, sola scriptura, uh, I will be drawing on archival documents in an attempt to recover episodes, episodes of inter interchange between the two scholars. Methodologically, this represents the shift in the field, one might say, from studying scholarship solely as thought to investigating it also as a form of social behavior. Panofsky first met Warburg in Berlin, and now this becomes relevant, in November 1915. And in December, he was inculcated in Warburg method by Warburg himself at the Warburg Library in Hamburg as part of a small invited group. He was 23 years old, Warburg was 49. Warburg was thus at his prime, the crippling mental breakdown that would send him to psychiatric clinics for five years, 1919 to 1924, was still in his future. Panofsky was at the very start of his career, already gaining notice, carving out his scholarly niche. Panofsky had studied with prominent art historians, formalists of different stripes, among them Wolflin, Goldschmidt, and the medievalist Föge, his doctor Vater. 
His cognate fields were philosophy and history. In 1911, his research trajectory had been set when he entered a two-year competition organized by the philosophical faculty at the University of Berlin, and he prepared a study on a set topic, Albrecht Dürer's art theory. He won the Grimm Prize for it in 1913, submitted the work as a doctoral dissertation in 1914, and published a revised version in 1915, as indicated in the title, the investigation of Dürer's aesthetics had propelled him into the study of Italian art theory and practice. We'll see this again, famous photo. In 1915, he was living in Berlin and continuing his studies as a member of Goldschmidt's famous seminar. This is all to say, when Panofsky made first contact with Warburg, he was a conventionally trained art historian, a Dürer man, with an interest in Renaissance artistic cultures on both sides of the Alps, conspicuously brilliant young scholar with a bent for questions of art theory, perspective, physiognomy, proportion, beauty. Now, Warburg traveled to Berlin again in November 1915, precisely to attend a meeting of the board of the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence. While there, he paid Goldschmidt a visit, and we now see that this would be a, a accustomed thing. These two were old friends. Goldschmidt arranged that Warburg meet the young men in his seminar. Much impressed, Warburg invited the group to Hamburg to visit his private research library, housed, we must remember, in the lower floors of his home, uh, the KBV, KBV will be built, of course, in the lot next door in due course. He, would, uh, he decided he would give a lecture and a tour and said that the students could stay a little bit longer to work in his library if they wished. Remarkably, there su survives in the Warburg Institute archive a page of notes and four of originally five cardboard sheets on which Warburg listed the themes, images, and texts he would use to introduce Goldschmidt's students to the rationale of his library. Each sheet is dated 27 December 1915. And I want to thank Claudia Vedapol for having put me onto these uh, some years ago and for helping with the transcription. On the reverse of one of the sheets is a set of lines, a sketch. I've reinforced these with uh, PowerPoint. This indicates a layout. So we may imagine that Warburg gathered clusters of black and white photographs and fastened them to uh, some sort of screen, a format he would use for later lectures and for drafts of plates of the famous pictorial atlas, Nemosune left unfinished at his death in 1929. The first of my purposes today is to use these documents to reconstruct what Panofsky might have heard in 1915. My greater aim, aim is to assess the impact of this first exposure to Warburg method and to revisit thereby certain standing questions. How did Panofsky perceive Warburg's work? What did he borrow? How did he transform it? To what ends? It will emerge, I believe, that early Warburg, indeed earliest Warburg, for that is what Warburg chose to present, provided the chief catalyst for the Warburgian strain in Panofsky's scholarship. This makes sense. Warburg's later ruminations, those developed during and after the time at the clinic in Kreuzlingen, largely unpublished, were primarily accessible to the innermost circle, to the staff of the library, Fritz Axel, Gertrude Bing, Edgar Wint, who was, of course, Panofsky's first doctoral student. Panofsky, while certainly part of this circle, does not seem to have imbibed Warburg's later notions, his developing notions of the symbol polarities, energetic inversion, orientation, uh, the shift to the modern worldview, magic to rational. We don't see that so much. In his obituary for Warburg, 
which Panofsky wrote in 1929, he distinguished between Warburg's working method, his Arbeitsmethodik, and his style of thinking, his Denkstil. The Denkstil for Panofsky was not to be imitated, not imitatable, because too close was the correspondence between the man and the work, between the person Warburg, who had fought free of his demons, and the pursuit of cultural acts of liberation. Panofsky was selective. And so let's go back to the start, 1915. Warburg had chosen the date December 27 to 30 for the visit of Goldschmidt's students, an awkward time for Christians. Ultimately, only Panofsky and Hans Kaufmann showed up. Goldschmidt was present, of course. And in this page of notes, see down below, where Warburg in his own hand recorded those present, we see that he filled out the guest list by inviting some locals, Gustav Pauli, director of the Kunsthalle, as well as two students from Hamburg, whose careers Warburg was following, Karl Georg Heise and Otto Westphal. In his letter of invitation to Goldschmidt, Warburg had said he thought he could best explain the rationale of his library through a lecture on the art historical significance of the engravings of Baccio Baldini. This is borne out by the key words on the four surviving sheets where the Florentine printmaker is prominent. On each of the four sheets, in addition to the date, one has the major theme inscribed that appears in the upper right-hand corner pathetic comparative, transition to the ideal style, costume realism under the influence of northern courtly and folk cultures, Orpheus, Patos Formam. The remainder of the space is filled with rapidly written, often abbreviated indications of sub-themes, images, and texts, and I give here a sample transcription. More works are listed than could possibly have been discussed. This was typical of Warburg. He preferred to speak spontaneously, drawing lines of connections from an, among a big array of images. With a little work, the keywords on the four sheets can be correlated with the content of his published writings. What emerges is that Warburg, in order to explain his library, decided to re recapitulate his own development he seems to have proceeded, more or less, from the dissertation on Botticelli through to the work on Dürer's Death of Orpheus of 1905. So kind of 1893 to 1905. This meant he largely confined himself to 15th century image, imagery, engaged with questions of style and the absorption of the antique, played up the theme of artistic exchange between Italy and the North, confined himself to secular iconography, drew in reference to Renaissance festivals, and emphasized the neglected forms of applied art on Gewandte Kunst, prints, tapestries, etc., which we know he held to be crucial documents of expression and of transmission. The leitmotif of Warburg's lecture might be language of the body. And I show here, sort of to be amusing, the title page and a leaf from a 1910 addition to his library to emphasize the sheer unorthodoxy of things that came in. Not only did he have Darwin and Pitteret, he had Die Sprache des Körpers. In here, uh, the, and these would have been on the shelves of Mimic. Here are four of seven, 721 photographs. One throws oneself forward back, uh, one throws oneself forward and backward to communicate extreme and yet specific emotions. I can't live like this, I can't bear it. Warburg, of course, considered himself to be, above all, a student of expression, whose principal contribution lay in the domain of uh, gesture, mimic. In the well-known letter already cited of 1903, written, in fact, to Goldschmidt, he classified himself as standing apart from those studying the history of artists and among those in group two concerned with the history of style which he called the science of typical forms. 
Historians of style, in his view, were those who study the constraints against which the heroic individual contends. Warburg's own contribution, he said, in 1903, was to study the constraints imposed on style by the way man communicates through mimetic expression. And so he opened his lecture to the Berlin students with bodily language. His treatment of the pathetic comparative began with this drawing by Botticelli. The issue was the effect of the insertion of agitated, intensifying elements derived from antique models. Second on the list was this Baldini print showing the cortege of Bacchus and Ariadne. Elsewhere, Warburg had called it the perfect embodiment of antiquity as the early Renaissance saw it. In a characteristic move, he correlated this movement-rich image with a description of a festive Florentine pageant in which a living embodied Bacchus appeared enthroned in a chariot surrounded by a chorus of Bacantes, life into art. And so it was an easy step to the next plate, the transition to the ideal style. The item I've bolded was one of Warburg's favorite demonstration pieces. Two versions of a print from the Baldini Almanac showing the children of the planets. Here figures cavort in amorous pleasure beneath Venus as the reigning planetary deity. <clears throat> in the first, two dancers are still encumbered by <clears throat> contemporary Franco-Flemish dress. In the second, liberation. As the woman exchanges her bulky garments for fluttering dress, surrenders her henna and veil for what Warburg would call Medusa wings, a form of Etruscan headgear, the artist made his way to the ideal style. For Warburg, the realistic rendering of costume a la Francese was the chief enemy of the new pathetic style a l'antica. Antiquarian idealism revealed in a certain archeological truth to costume and accessory <clears throat> it was an essential feature of reawakened antiquity and the return to worldly joy in life. Medieval realism, by contrast, allowed no distance between present and past, subsequently one of Panofsky's key themes. <clears throat> Warburg pursued this theme in the next sequence, costume realism, where the lessons of the applied arts were signaled. And then he turned to a screen, all important for Panofsky, the death of Orpheus. There he could treat the recovery of authentic, pathetic types, focusing on the Dionysian element. Warburg drew directly from his 1905 essay, Dior and Italian Antiquity, the essay in which he had introduced his famous coinage, Pato's Formal, to describe the circumscription of extreme emotion in forms that lived in memory. Young Dürer, drawing on a Mantuan print of violent death, had appropriated an archeologically authentic type, echt antique, whose roots could be traced to ancient Greece. The type had been animated in drama by Poliziano in his Orfeo and in art by Polaiuolo with his muscular rhetoric. And one must imagine that Warburg would have spoken to the Berlin students of his own work in excavating, quote, the long migration that brought antique superlatives of gesture from Athens by way of Rome, Mantua, and Florence to Nuremberg and the mind of Albrecht Dürer. Panofsky's scholarly future was in part adumbrated. Here comes Tupengeschichte. Two days later, Warburg gave a tour of his library in which he brought home methodological points. Keywords on a surviving page of notes show his emphases. On the very top, an institute for the study of expression. At the very bottom, an institute for methodological overstepping of boundaries and in the middle, from content into form. What came next, I think, is very interesting. Panofsky had proceeded to Dresden. From there, he wrote a letter to Warburg that can be considered the first application of Warburg method by this figure. 
Panofsky seems to have been particularly gripped by the notion of pathos figures, as he called them, and his eye had been made alert to the transmission and transformation of bodily and gestural schemata. There, in the Königliche Gemäldegalerie, he was struck by the posture of an apostle in an image of the transfiguration, the metamorphosis. It was a work, as you see, then cataloged as Byzantine, now recognized to be 16th century Russian. Panofsky sent Warburg a sketch of the terrified onlooker, which he said harked back to our Eridanus figure. This hints at the contents of the lost plate. Warburg clearly used imagery of the constellations to chart Renaissance reclamation of echt antique forms. Warburg's reply to Panofsky's letter was at once cordial and corrective. He instead placed emphasis on the psychological roots of the image type and the function of the appropriation. He forwarded to Panofsky a black and white photograph of this wall painting from Herculaneum depicting the cult of Isis. And he suggested that the apostle's posture contains after echoes of the gestural movements of the ancient mysteries. A dramatic ordering that lives on even today in the sword dance and the moresca, quite a different thrust. And in this exchange, I think we already have a whiff of Padro's distinction between art as like knowledge and art as like social behavior. So, and I'll be drawing to a close now. Five years later, Panofsky landed at the newly founded University of Hamburg, having been encouraged to habilitate there by Gustav Pauli, whom he had met during the 1915 visit of the seminar. Now memories, buried memories, of that first and emphatic encounter with Warburg method could be reanimated. Warburg himself was absent, removed to mental clinics, and it was assumed he would never return, which I think is important. The library, still housed in his private home, was now directed by his former assistant, the Vienna-trained art historian Fritz Zaxel. Panofsky and Zaxel rapidly became friends and collaborators, and Zaxel, the chief mediator of Warburg for Panofsky. Together, they worked to forge a Hamburg School of Art History, a place where a student could pursue not only normal art history, but also the more controversial branch, which was iconography. Panofsky had quickly seen the possibilities. 1921, he wrote Zaxel that a link with the Warburg Library would mean that instead of a normal university seminar of the kind that could equally be found in Greifswald or Tübingen, the University of Hamburg would possess a fully individual research institute, one that provided means and matter and direction. To his old friend Kurt uh, Bat, Panofsky explained just what access to the Warburg Library was giving him. The essential thing for me here in Hamburg is that the Warburg Library, whose program is the combination of the histories of art, philosophy, and religion, has greatly expanded my horizon, Gesichtskreis, and also offers me an invaluable opportunity for work. There's something very good about having together in a single laboratory all that is needed for knowledge of a historical phenomenon in its entire extent. And here he may show himself primed to absorb the neo-Kantian lessons of his new colleague, Ernst Gesserer, which were soon coming. During his very first teaching year, 1920-21, when he taught a class on Dürer, Panofsky decided to try his hand at a Warburgian study. By June 1921, he had completed Dürer's attitude toward antiquity which can only be seen as an homage and answer to development and reworking of Warburg's Dürer and Italian antiquity. And Georges de Ubermann um, has in a different way pursued this comparison very nicely. It's poignant to recall the historical circumstances. In early 1921, just as Panofsky is starting writing this essay, Warburg was in Jena 
this was before Kreuzlingen, in the mental clinic, and he expressed, Farberg expressed his extreme mental anguish in a letter to his wife saying, if he were not allowed to return home, he would die an ignoble death, like, quote, the death of Orpheus under the hands of the cudgeling menads. So powerfully was this pathos formal implanted in his own memory. Warburg, in his 1905 essay, has written, with obvious reference to Nietzsche, antiquity came to Durer by way of Italian art, not merely as a Dionysian stimulant, but as a source of Apollonian clarity. Panofsky used his own essay to develop this insight at length. And in developing it, to a remarkable degree, he mapped out his future intellectual trajectory with respect to the Renaissance problem. Panofsky naturally incorporated material from his own pre-Warburg dissertation, and he debated the views of the whole panoply of other Durer scholars. Still, he managed to weave a great many Warburgianisms into a synthetic new creation. Panofsky's signature moves are already in evidence. He can be seen rationalizing and systematizing on a philosophical basis. Whereas Warburg discusses types, Panofsky analyzes typification. The pathos formal, Warburg, Warburg's visual superlative, is characterized by Panofsky as reductive, universalizing, implying moderation. If Warburg had, fun had focused on the function of the Dionysian, Panofsky harmonized the polarities. And here are his two versions of uh, the same uh, quote by him. In Greek art, there is neither beauty without movement nor pathos without moderation. The Apollonian, one might say, is Dionysian in potentia, while Dionysian is Apollonian in actu. This characterization of the harmonic, uh, harmonious classical was crucial to Panofsky's project, providing the norm against which he could characterize mentalities, medieval versus Renaissance, Northern versus Italian, each defined by its attitude toward this antiquity. From Sachs's point of view, Panofsky's essay was quali qualified as fully Warburgian. In a letter to Warburg, uh, in the clinic, Zoxel said that he had supplied Panofsky with a lot of material and noted that he was pleased that the library was motivating research in Warburg's mold. But Panofsky himself would later call Warburg's 1905 essay Richtung geben, direction setting, which is a little more ambiguous. Panofsky and Zoxel in those first years did a lot of thinking about what Warburg could offer scholarly practice and pedagogy. Warburg always had to be mediated. In 1922, to honor the absent Warburg and to please the Warburg family, Zoxel published an accessible introduction to Warburg's oeuvre with demonstrations. And he we find from a later letter, involved Panofsky in writing this article, and one must imagine it was a clarifying experience for both, working through the whole corpus. Shortly after, the two began publishing together, exploring Warburgian potentials. They were complementary intellects. Typically, Zoxel would supply material and sort of latent theses, and then Panofsky would transform these into principles about which Zoxel would retain a healthy skepticism. In April 20, 1924, to the surprise of all, Warburg returned home, semi-cured, and took control of his library and embarked on a remarkable expansionist program, including the construction of the new library building, pursuing new and active lines of research. But by this time, Panofsky was not so impressionable he had already borrowed and built upon Warburg's ideas, had already integrated into the, his own projects. So Panofsky was not, of course, a disciple of Warburg with all that that implies. This was recognized by Hans Kaufmann, who we remember was present at the 1915 seminar. Kaufmann outlived his friend and prepared a lengthy obituary. 
In it, he called attention to Panofsky's eclecticism, his sequential engagements with the work of admired predecessors. Kaufman persuasively summarized, Panofsky meisterte alle Instrumente, Panofsky mastered all instruments. So let me make one final point. In this paper, I've worked within a well-established art historical dink form. The warburg panofsky comparison is a form in which people have done a good deal of thinking, defining, clarifying. But it's not my sense that the future study of Warburg's reception will lie here, or if so, only as part of a much larger project. Scores of scholars aligned themselves at given moments with the Warburg project. This much has become clear to me in my work in the Warburg Institute archive. There are manifold ways to engage with Warburg's elusive but electrifying endeavor uh, to find guidance among the fragments. Awareness of collective thinking about Warburg in the past, I would say, will help us to keep this study alive in our present. Thank you. <laughs>